Good evening. Wow, that's loud. That's cool. Good evening. Come on. Good. Let's try it again. Good evening. Very good. All right. What else can I get you to do? So I'm Larry Calvers, and I'm very happy to be here tonight. I'm in the 14th happiest country in the world, uh, which, you know, it's okay. So just a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, please, uh, especially students, stay until the end of the Q&A. The Q&A can be uh, very important and interesting, so please stay until then. For those of you who want to ask a question, the key part of that is question, not make a speech, right? So if you have questions, we'll, we'll be glad to take those, and we'll run a, a microphone up to you at that point. Uh, so I want to thank a few people, Nancy Donovan and her students. And Nancy has said how important you students are, so I'm going to name all of you. Uh, shout out to Grant Hudson, Christina McLean, Katie Heron, Victoria Aitken, Olivia Kernett, Alice Donnelly, Allison Ingray, Patrick Raison, or Raisin, uh, Drew Stevenson. There's 50 more, so hold on. No, that's it. Okay. Thanks uh, very much. Appreciate all the work that you do. And also a shout out to Natalie Durdeck for her work on communications, publicity, and all the other things. Yay. And just one more thank you. So I would not be in front of you tonight uh, if it was not for Chad and Ginny Dreyer's generous contribution to endow the chair that I hold. Uh, I'm saying that tonight because Chad Dreyer is here in the audience. Chad, thank you so much. Uh, we were just saying it's unbelievable that now I'm in my 12th year here and it just doesn't seem possible. Some of you think I've been here forever, I know, but thank you. So tonight we have a great speaker, a return speaker, our second return speaker of this year, uh, Ed Kleinbart. He's the Ivadell and Theodore Johnson Professor of Law and Business at the University of Southern California. I'm not sure where that is. Uh, Gold School of Law and a fellow at the Century Foundation. He was one of four individuals honored at the 2016 International Tax Person of the Year by the Nonpartisan Policy Organization Tax Analysts. He's the author of numerous academic papers and a book, We Are Better Than This, How Government Should Spend Our Money. Uh, the, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist David K. Johnston described this book as a masterpiece of tax, fiscal, and economic policy. By the way, if you think David K. Johnston's name is familiar. He was one of my previous speakers. And also, he was the guy who somehow got uh, President Trump's tax return from 2005. So Professor Kleinbard has testified before the Congress on tax policy matters, has written opinion pieces for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Huffington Post, and CNN.com, as well as other media outlets. He joined USC Law in 2009. Before that, he served as the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Congress's Joint Committee on Taxation. Prior to his appointment as staff uh, of the Joint Committee on Taxation, he was for over 20 years a partner in the New York office of Cleary, Gottlieb, Steen, and Hamilton LLP. He received his JD from Yale Law School, his MA in History, and BA in Medieval and Renaissance Studies from Bound University. It is very knowledgeable in tax, very interesting, and thought-provoking, and sometimes even controversial. And we hope that we're gonna get him to smile tonight, because he lives also in the 14th happiest country in the world. So please give a warm welcome to Ed Kleinberg. Thank you very much, Larry, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Larry was extremely kind in titling my talk uh, as sort of all and everything, as long as it had the word tax in it. Uh, and so uh, some of you may be here under a misapprehension. Uh, those of you who had hoped to hear a one-hour lecture on uh, Speaker Paul Ryan's destination-based cash flow tax reform proposal for co the corporate income tax uh, will be disappointed. Uh, I don't propose to go into tax reform, notwithstanding the title uh, of the uh, lecture, uh, because uh, things are simply too uncertain. Uh, 
and the topic is too tedious. Uh, so, I, I, in fact, the topic that interests me is the topic that Larry just joked about, which is how can it be that we are the richest large economy in the world and only the 14th happiest? That's a, that's a strange place to be. Why is that, that we are so rich and yet not extraordinarily happy to boot? Uh, and that, that is a topic that I think actually relates to tax policy, but more important to the other side of the same coin, which is government spending policy. And the two together are, of course, fiscal policy, the, the taxing and spending by government. And I think that the reason that we are the 14th happiest country uh, in the world uh, is precisely because we have a very uh, skewed perspective on what fiscal policy means. So that, in fact, uh, turns out uh, uh, by serendipity to be the actual topic I want to talk about. Um, and that's why I titled this redistribution is a four-letter word, because I'm going to begin by describing how uh, the term redistribution or redistributive taxation, in fact, has implicit uh, kinds of bias in it that change the conversations that we have about government and how we relate to government in ways uh, that redound to our collective unhappiness. So uh, let me begin by sort of giving you fellows an overview of what I'm going to try to accomplish. Um, I have five, five points that I want to make. The first, I've already hinted at, that redistribution is not a neutral term. Uh, it has uh, its own uh, implicit framing of issues, which in turn lead to different outcomes than if we were to think about issues starting from a, a different starting point. Uh, and that has in turn has a stranglehold uh, on how uh, we uh, talk today about fiscal policy in this country. Second, and this obviously uh, uh, will strike many of you as extremely strange, uh, I'm going to argue that it is clear that a larger government, I, that's not a typographical error, that a larger government from where we are today would lead to more economic growth, more broadly shared, and greater happiness in this country. Uh, third, I'm going to try to convince you uh, that uh, Insurance is uh, uh, a, a key uh, feature of what government can provide, that government insurance plays a special role in uh, 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 ameliorating uh, some of the contingencies of life that we all face, um, and that private insurance uh, uh, cannot uh, meet. Fourth, I'm going to argue, and for those of you a little bit younger than me. I mean, I don't give a, 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 I have to clean up my language. I spent so many years in New York. Uh, uh, it is of no consequence to me, since I will not live to see it, but for those of you who are a little bit younger and who actually care about the future, our, our obsession with small government beggars our collective future. And finally, and I'm trying to move, as you can see, from sort of a purely economic point, to ones that sound a little bit more in moral philosophy, which I think is consistent and appropriate for a school like this one in particular, this university, that democracy is an exercise in empathy for our fellow citizens, for citizens, the people we do not know and whom, if we did know, we probably would not like. But nonetheless, they are our fellow citizens, uh, and we make that empathy tangible through fiscal policy. So those of you who don't want to pay the babysitter for an extra hour can leave now. You, you, you've, already, you've already heard the, the gist of, what, of, of the topic. But uh, for those of you who want to stay, uh, I'm going to try and go through each of those in a little bit more detail. So let me take on redistribution first and suggest that it is not a neutral term, you know, um, uh, as, as uh, we hear it used all the time. Uh, the tax system is redistributive because we raise money from uh, uh, the most successful and we you know, fill in the blank, give money, transfer money, whatever verb you want to use to those uh, uh, 
uh, who uh, uh, lack income security. Uh, it is not, in fact, a value-neutral term the way downstream and upstream are value-neutral terms when you describe the flow of water in a river. Uh, uh, what's more, we use those terms, redistributive and redistribution, almost exclusively in the context of tax law when we forget that the principal drivers of redistribution, even in that sense, in fact, is the spending side of the fiscal ledger. And just to make sure we all understand what I mean, you know, the, the standard way we think of, uh, that a, an economist would think of the world is uh, that what we should do is we'll let the chips fall where they may. Some will make a lot of money, some not, won't make much money. Whatever happens in the market economy, which is real, uh, if we're not satisfied, if we collectively vote for a more equal society, well, we'll deal with that through the tax system by redistribution, by taxing uh, the successful and transferring to the less successful. That formulation, which is considered value neutral, is in fact pernicious. Uh, it assumes its conclusion, it shortchanges our collective welfare, our happiness, uh, and it does so and, and at this point, I'm, I'm trying to be nice to, to uh, uh, economists everywhere. It does so consciously or unconsciously uh, in, in the service of uh, limiting the size of government uh, in this country. So what's so bad about redistribution? Why do I get so exercised about the use of this word? Well, the, the re right there to begin with, is actually kind of troubling if you think about it, because it assumes that the market distribution of outcomes uh, is, a, is a neutral starting point, which gives it a kind of legitimacy. Uh, now, I'm not quite as much of a socialist as, as, as some would have it, but uh, the fact is that uh, uh, market outcomes have a tremendous amount of luck associated with them, as well as skill and effort. Uh, 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 so it, it ignores that aspect. It ignores the fact that uh, that outcomes are not, in fact, uh, uh, the decision of the gods as to our inner merit, uh, but rather uh, are a completely unpredictable amalgam of of what we're born with, the, the context in which we grow up, as well as our, uh, our uh, individual effort and so on. Uh, it, the, the idea that the market outcomes are necessarily sort of a, a, a neutral starting point ignores the incredibly, uh, incredible collective investment that has gone on for millennia in creating the social networks uh, in creating the legal networks that pre-exist uh, before we can even enter the market economy. Uh, and I think most interestingly, it puts what is known as the endowment effect in direct opposition to redistribution, which means that redistribution always loses. The endowment effect is, um, uh, Daniel Kahneman and others uh, uh, have done a uh, tremendous amount of work on this over the years. The endowment effect is the, the idea that we hate losing things more than we like the prospect of getting things. Uh, if I have $100 uh, and you offer me a, a, a fair bet, I can either make 50 or lose 50, I'd never accept that bet because I, say, I, I don't want to lose half my, my, my wealth uh, uh, just for the prospect of you know, maybe uh, coming out on the lucky side of that. Uh, people cling uh, uh, like Gollum to their wealth in, in ways that uh, they don't value as highly the prospect of having even more. So if you begin with the idea that market outcomes have in a kind of implicit legitimacy, what then follows from that is that taking that away is illegitimate, that taking that away uh, uh, directly conflicts with the absolutely uh, uh, demonstrated endowment effect for which we all are susceptible. We all tend to value what we have and losing what we have more than the prospect of getting more. Uh, and uh, 
as I said a, a minute ago, finally, it, it overemphasizes the role of tax policy, when in fact, uh, what we should be thinking about is government spending policy, all of which, all of which, when put together, tends to lead us to be very comfortable thinking of this word uh, as a way that it, uh, of implying that what goes on when we have redistribution is that we're, gonna ta we're going to tax the makers to give to the takers. And that is a very pernicious way of relating to our fellow citizens. So uh, take this quotation here. Repeal and replace, that's the, you know, the, the, the current debate about uh, health care. So the repeal and replace bill, as proposed by the House of Representatives uh, leadership, uh, is a gigantic transfer of wealth from the lowest income Americans to the highest income Americans. A pithy quotation uh, taken from the New York Times the other day from some smart aleck alleged... Ex oh, that's, it was me. Uh, so, yeah, this, this, <laughs> this, 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 this was... And... and um, I, I was criticized uh, 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 by a sophisticated uh, reader who did not quarrel with my description of the flow of money. Obviously, uh, under the, uh, the House proposal, uh, the poorest Americans will simply have hundreds of billions of dollars less invested in their health care, and the wealthiest Americans will enjoy a very large tax cut uh, in the form of the repeal of the taxes introduced in the Affordable Care Act in 2010 to pay for the large-scale health care reform that we uh, uh, introduced in 2010. So the flow of wealth, the flow is not, is not what my interlocutor questioned, but what he questioned was the idea that it can be described as a wealth transfer because that implied that this was money that was legitimately, or wealth, um, in the form of healthcare policies that was legitimately owned by the poor that was now being transferred. And, uh, and he said, no, 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 the way you have to think about things is this was my money, because it turns out that the interlocutor uh, 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 was himself affluent. Uh, this was my money to begin with. You people took it away from me in 2010, and now I'm just getting back what's mine. Uh, and from that perspective, this isn't a wealth transfer at all. If you think about that, it, it's really quite interesting it, um, way of seeing the world. Uh, uh, and it's true that the Affordable Care Act is very new in terms of our, our sort of social consciousness. But if you think about it in terms of social security, if I were to say, you know what, I'm going to give a, you know, a, a $600 billion tax cut to the richest Americans, and I'm going to pay for that by cutting everybody else's social security benefits, then I think that my statement about a wealth transfer uh, would uh, ring more true, even to that interlocutor and, and probably to many of you, because we have a sense that we have a property interest in social security. And perhaps more radically, if I were to start from the proposition that uh, health care is a birthright, which is true in countries 1 through 13, as it happens, uh, <laughs> interestingly. If I start from the view that healthcare is a birthright, then it is very clear that taking that birthright away to give tax cuts to the, to the most affluent Americans uh, uh, is, in fact, as I described it. Uh, so instead of thinking about things as, as redistribution uh, from rich to poor, whether we use the, the pejorative you know, makers and takers, or whether we simply say that these are transfer payments that are funded from the most affluent Americans. Let's imagine how we might reframe things instead. And I would argue that the place to start is with an observation that all of us, especially in the tax law ac uh, academy, tend to forget, which is that the business of government is spending money, not taxing. Taxing is just how government pays for the spending that is the purpose of government. Uh, uh, the tax revenues that are collected uh, are not simply put in a big pile and set on fire. Uh, uh, they actually buy stuff, and the stuff that they buy 
uh, besides the military. By the way, that's something where we're number one. For those of you who feel depressed that we're only number 14 in happiness, you'll be glad to know that not only are we number one in military spending, but in fact, we spend about as much as numbers two through 14 I mean, literally do. We spend uh, about 44% of the world's spending on, on military. Uh, uh, we just choose not to pay for it by taxing ourselves accordingly. This gave rise you know, to Stephen Colbert's observation a few years ago that uh, America is the new Sparta, except less tolerant of homosexuality. Uh, it, it, uh, so that is something where we're number one. But uh, uh, we purchase investments and we purchase insurance within the ambit of fiscal policy. We purchase investments and we purchase insurance uh, with the money that we raise through taxes. And the right place to start is, are there any interesting investment opportunities here? If you were to talk to the CEO of a Fortune 100 company and say, what's new? He would not say to you, well, you know, we got a fantastic medium-term note program going, uh, and we sold some bonds at, at a very low interest rate. Of course not. He'd say, I did this, I built that, I'm opening up this facility, because that's what businesses do. They spend money. How they raise the money they spend is interesting only to the CFO and the treasurer. And the same is true for government. It's how government spends money and how government uh, uh, it, uh, uses, mon uses its resources to ensure its citizens that, in fact, define uh, what a government's all about. Now, it turns out that public investment is not, in fact, the same as hosting uh, the world's biggest fireworks display on the 4th of July. Uh, there are positive economic returns to, to public investment that can be measured the same way any other return on investment can be measured. So in the narrowest economic sense, there are important returns to public investment in the narrowest sense, but also public investment uh, of which we do quite literally net zero today, public investment in things like roads and infrastructure, public investment in infrastructure in this country is a tiny bit more than zero net of depreciation uh, today. Uh, public investment also creates a lot of good quality jobs, and not everybody in the, in the United States wants to be or will enjoy being a software engineer uh, in Silicon Valley. And the fact that we don't have a lot of good quality jobs of the sort that used to be in the manufacturing sector is in large part because we are systematically underinvesting in a kind of hard infrastructure that, that uh, could lead to those kinds of career paths. Uh, it's obviously more than that. It's also investment, as we're going to talk about, in education, uh, in basic research. Uh, 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 and as I say, it both has measurable economic returns and creates career paths to jobs with dignity. Jimmy Breslin uh, just passed away. Uh, many of you have never heard of Jimmy Breslin and certainly haven't read him, but this was his great theme. I learned Jimmy Breslin was uh, the Alfred P. Doolittle of the United States. Uh, uh, he was uh, a, a, a so pe uh, people's philosopher who recognized that the dignity of work is how we define ourselves uh, in this country. Insurance is um, uh, another area where the government simply can do things that uh, the private sector cannot do very well, as we'll see when we talk about healthcare in a minute. So if we think about, about the world, in, uh, not in terms of redistributive taxes, but rather, hey, are there any interesting investment opportunities here? Are there, are there opportunities for government to insure us against the vicissitudes of life in ways that the private sector cannot, that we all think are a good idea? And then, geez, can we afford it all? That's a radically different way of thinking about our relation to each other and to government. So I want to talk for a minute before I move on about how much redistribution we actually do because um, many of you, I think, will be very surprised. The, the United States, is basically the lowest taxed large economy in the world. 14th happiest and lowest taxed. Very strange. Richest, lowest taxed, 14th happiest. Uh, I, I've, uh, in this 
Is this, yeah, so in this, I, I've chosen for the next couple of slides to compare us to Germany. Uh, they're a dour bunch. I don't know where they rank in, 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 in the happiness uh, list. Uh, but we, most of us would think of Germany as a very successful economy, but they raise year in and year out 10 percentage points of their GDP more in taxes than we do. And yet somehow people show up for work. Amazing. They have not all retreated to the beach to read the fountainhead for the third time. Uh, uh, so we are a low-tax, small government economy that turns out to do very little redistribution. The genie, this has nothing to do, you know, with, with Barbara Eden, this genie. This, this is uh, 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 Mr. Genie, was an economist years ago, and it's a measure, uh, uh, imperfect, but, but a one-number measure of inequality in a society. And it goes from zero, which is perfectly equal, to one, which means one guy has it all. And I know what every one of you in this room is thinking, that, that could work if, for, for me. But, but it, 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 so um, uh, the number, it, it, take it as a rough measure of inequality in a society. And we can measure it before tax, that is just a market, market outcomes. We can measure it after tax. We can measure it after tax and transfer payments. So what these numbers down here do is look at market income, including things like the value of uh, health insurance provided by employers to their employees because it's quite valuable. So we're throwing that into the hopper, to be fair. Uh, so uh, we're comparing market incomes to, so to disposable income, which is after tax and after any government transfer program, so after money out for taxes, in for any transfers. Uh, and by that measure, you can see that the United States does much less uh, than Germany. We start with essentially the same market income inequality of around 0.5 between the zero to one scale. But after we get all through with the intervention of government, Germany has reduced that to 0.29, the United States to 0.39. The United States, a materially more unequal society after tax, after transfer payments than Germany, notwithstanding that they begin from the same level of market inequality. These numbers uh, are different uh, 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 principally because they, they limit the data set to working age populations, 18 to 65, uh, which I bitterly resent since I'm still working. Um, but uh, that is the standard measure. Uh, and again, what you see is that the United States, by this measure, has somewhat more inequality than Germany does to start with. Uh, uh, after we take into account uh, taxes and transfer payments received, the United States has reduced its inequality by 18% and Germany by 28%. That's a very large difference. It's a very large difference to live in a society in which, in which uh, after the intervention of government, uh, the, the uh, level of inequality uh, has been reduced so much more dramatically. Uh, it turns out that the reason for this is that there are two levers to progressivity. Uh, the idea, uh, uh, it's not just a question of having higher tax rates on higher brackets of income, so-called you know, uh, progressive income tax rate structure. And in fact, our preoccupation with the progressive income tax as the sole way to think about progressivity is exactly the mistake that this country has made uh, for the last many decades. This is the great failing of, of progressives in this country, is to get so whipped up about the idea of what is the top tax rate on the top income earner, because it turns out that well-designed public spending is inherently very progressive. If you think about what other countries, let's say countries in the top 13 and happiness do, well, healthcare is a birthright, all right? If you're very rich, who gives a damn? You go wherever you want and pay whoever you want and get the health care you want. But it matters a lot to everybody else. Uh, 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 early childhood uh, nursery school type programs and early childhood uh, babysitting programs, again, um, for the rich, you know, you hire the nanny you want. For the poor, that absolutely changes your life. Uh, free college education which is the norm in many of the top 13 countries, or very low tax uh, higher education, 
uh, again, is something of great value. So my joke in, in uh, the book I wrote, which I might even mention two or three more times, is, uh, 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 it, look, if any three of you buy it, you will double my sale, it is, um, you know, that not even George W. Bush proposed the No Polo Fields Left Behind Act. Uh, government spending, by its nature, almost inherently, is extremely progressive. It benefits lower income citizens more than the highest income citizens. So progressive tax rates aren't what drives progressivity in terms of progressive fiscal system like we see with Germany. In fact, it's the opposite. Germany's tax system is less progressive than that of the United States. Uh, 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 it's, in fact, mildly regressive. Uh, but their commitment to public investment and insurance is much larger than we are. And it's the spending side, not the taxing side, that dominates the actual lives people lead. So the United States has a very progressive tax in the sense of you know, higher rates, the more income you earn uh, um, uh, than it does other countries. So on um, this horizontal x-axis is the degree of progressivity of the tax system in the abstract. And the United States is way over on the right, by far the most progressive tax system around. And on the vertical axis is how effective the tax system, or the t uh, sorry, the tax and spending system of that country is, the fiscal system in its entirety, in uh, reducing inequality. So we have by far the most progressive tax system, and by far the smallest effect on remediating uh, or ameliorating uh, inequality. How can those two things be true? Well, it's really simple. It's the size of the system that drives the results. The United States, always proud to be an outlier. This, on the x-axis, total tax revenue, we call it exceptional, by the way, not, not outlier. Uh, uh, the the x-axis is the total tax revenue as a percentage of each country's GDP, its national income. And again, we see you know, the United States in the mid-20s, Germany in the mid-30s for tax revenue as a percentage of national income. And on the vertical axis, we see, uh, again, how much the taxes, um, how much the fiscal system is reducing or, or ameliorating inequality. And what you see is that the United States, with a small tax system, we are a low-tax country, we collect, uh, in terms of our total collections, uh, is, uh, uh, does much less by way of income um, uh, 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 amelioration, of income security for the poorest citizens than does Germany or any other country that you can name. The fact is that a progressive tax system by itself doesn't do diddly if it's also a very small system. I can impose a $1,000 tax on all incomes over a million dollars. That scores as progressive because only incomes over a million dollars pay it. But it doesn't do anything for this country. And that, in effect, is the world we live in. We say, what is the most painful possible way to get to the, the, the government that progressives, at least, would like? Well, I know. Let's go up to every rich person and punch them in the nose, see, and ask them to say thank you. And it turns out not to be a very effective strategy. The strategy that does work is to say, let's offer a uh, health care as a birthright, let's offer education as a birthright, and so on, and let's say we'll pay for it broadly, but by virtue of the fact that those uh, 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 spending programs so disproportionately uh, redound to the benefit of lower income citizens, you end up with a more progressive fiscal systems. All right, so that was uh, uh, the first uh, point I want to make. The second, it'll go faster. My voice will give out. The second uh, big point I want I, I, I want to make uh, is this idea of inclusive growth. Because I said something provocative right at the very beginning, which is that a larger government will lead to higher growth as well as more broadly shared growth. And I realize that for those of you who are thinking about those words, that that must have sounded quite discordant because we all know that government does everything badly that uh, we all know that we, have, look, we draw supply and demand curves and they intersect and then government comes along and imposes a tax and we have dead weight loss. How could it possibly be the case? How could it possibly be the case that more government would lead to higher growth? 
Uh, and in fact, there's an answer. And the answer is what I like to call the complementary economy. It turns out that growth gets, uh, increases, the economic pie gets bigger when the government complements the private sector. We don't, we're not talking here about government competing with the private sector. Where the private sector operates uh, 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 normally, it does an extraordinary job. There's a, almost a magical quality to prices in, their, in the ability of the price system to communicate so much information to buyers and sellers, to, promote, to potential entrants into a marketplace. I understand and appreciate all of that. But what I also understand and appreciate is that uh, the private markets are imperfect. They're incomplete. They are, uh, there are areas they cannot reach. There are other areas where they uh, do so badly. Uh, and in those instances, not in all instances, but in those instances, we can design uh, uh, systems where the government complements the private sector and government does what it does best, and the result turns out to be a, a larger uh, uh, economic pie, a faster growth rate, and one that is more broadly shared. And once you see that as, in fact, possibly true, it could be, but we'll see. Uh, it turns out that there is no makers versus takers. It's a question of smart investment versus uh, dumb investment. It's a question of investment versus beggaring our own future. Uh, and, and so since uh, you know, we don't have hours and hours to go through all the data, I took a couple of quotations from um, uh, a recent study by the OECD. The OECD is the uh, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. It's uh, sort of the trade association of the 34 uh, uh, largest economies uh, in the world, other than the BRICS, other than uh, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Uh, the 34 includes some hangers-on, you know, uh, Lithuania squeaked in somehow, but uh, all, all the countries you would think of as, as comparables to us are in the OECD, and the OECD produces a lot of interesting reports and a tremendous treasure trove of data comparing each uh, of its member states to the others. And I find the OECD data very interesting in developing report cards. So where does the United States do well? Where does it do badly? Uh, the IMF, the, in the International Monetary Fund, which is about as orthodox a bunch of uh, economists as you could possibly imagine, has come to exactly the same view as that of the OECD, uh, uh, quite remarkably. And, and I, I, I don't want to put you all to sleep by reading you a bedtime story, but what OECD said is sufficiently important that I do want to read it. New research, said the OECD, finds consistent evidence that the long-term rise in the inequality of disposable incomes observed in most countries has put a significant break on long-term growth. Greater inequality has led to slower growth. Further, this research shows that efforts to reduce inequality do not lead to slower growth. So the intervention of government does not cause uh, uh, people to quit their jobs and retire to hammocks uh, on the beach. Rising income equality has a significant income on uh, impact on economic growth, and largely because it reduces the capacity of the poorer segments which turns out to be 40 percent. That's a, you remember the United States, that's like 130 million people are the poorest 40 percent. Uh, uh, the uh, capacity of the bottom 40 percent of the population to invest enough in their own skills and education. So just think about this for a minute. If you were a business person uh, and thinking about a country as a business, you would quickly recognize that our largest asset class as a country is us, ourselves. It is our labor income that generates the bulk of the national income of the United States. 60 plus percent of our national income is a direct result of our work. Uh, and you would therefore think uh, that if I invest more in these you know, machines that, that, that walk, um, and uh, uh, talk back, uh, uh, that uh, maybe I'd get more out of them. 
And so it is. So it turns out to be the case. It's absolutely clear. You invest more in education. That's how you invest in the machines we call people. If you invest in people through education, they turn out to be happier. Maybe we could all get all the way, I don't know, up to number 11 or 12 in my lifetime. They turn out to be happier, and they also turn out to be more productive in a narrow economic sense. Of course they do, because in this sense, they are machines that are in which we are systematically under-investing. We are pissing away, is the technical economic term, <laughs> tremendous value by not investing enough in the quality public education of those Americans who cannot simply buy their way out of the problem. Think about it, if you want, uh, uh, to, from a different perspective. Think about it in terms of the values we like to wave around uh, when we talk to each other. It, quality of opportunity. We don't guarantee a quality of outcomes in this country, but by golly, we have a quality of opportunity. Well, if only that were true, because it isn't. Uh, a quality of opportunity demands a comparable investment in comparably able children regardless of their parents' wealth. And yet the data are depressingly clear uh, here. Uh, uh, me, uh, I'm not speaking about anybody in this room, of course, mediocre rich kids get into colleges, better colleges, uh, than do highly talented poor kids. Uh, 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 they receive uh, greater uh, 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 forms of supplementary, supplementary uh, 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 education along the way. And who but government can make up that difference, right? We don't, unlike a, a, a machine, you know, that, 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 uh, that burns fossil fuels and requires, you know, a lube job once in a while, uh, we don't, in fact, uh, allow people to invest directly in other people and have an ownership interest in them. Uh, we took care of that issue some time ago. And so, who but government is going to make the kinds of investments by which uh, comparably able kids have comparable opportunities? Uh, uh, private markets simply cannot. And yet we find not only uh, do we find that uh, uh, rich kids get into you know, better colleges, rich mediocre kids uh, get into better colleges th than you would expect sim based simply on their ability, but we find that in the United States, because across the country so much education is tied to local school district financing, which in turn is tied to real estate prices, we find that the United States is one of the two or three countries in the OECD where public education is spent, we spend more on the public education of rich kids than poor kids. It is the most perverse policy you could possibly describe if your interest was that of a highly productive economy, faster growth rate, uh, and happier people. So, the systematic differences that are in the educational investments that are made in each uh, little sort of sort of tyro machine, as seen uh, in, in the audience here, uh, uh, that will grow into you know a highly productive, uh, uh, you know, uh, slightly jaded 50-year-old. Uh, the systematic differences that w uh, in those educational investments turn out to convert today's income inequality into an hereditable gene. Uh, and the reason is very simple. Uh, uh, you can preserve your family's place in the pecking order if you're affluent by simply pouring more resources into the machine you call your kid uh, than um, uh, a, a a more able kid from a less advantaged background is able to do so. And we see that in the data. Our economic mobility outcomes um, are worse than Canada's. They're worse than Northern Europe's. Have as much choice over that. Uh, we get, don't uh, uh, get to choose whether we're in you know, the, the passenger seat of a car that gets in a, into a serious accident and so on. So it turns out that the, and this is, a very important idea that people find very difficult. The outcomes uh, of our lives are much less in our control than we like to think. We like to think that we control our destiny uh, and we don't control all of it. We have some at the margins. We can affect our own destiny, of course, but we don't control uh, the entirety of our destiny the way we all like to think we do. And government insurance, again, is what responds here. 
insurance by definition, the queen of financial products. We've had insurance as a financial product since the 13th century in Italy, in Genoa. Insurance ameliorates the financial consequence of what in the insurance business is called adverse fortuities, bad luck. Your house burns down, you have fire insurance. Uh, the the uh, insurance uh, ameliorates the financial consequences of that bad luck. Government insurance can do this in areas that private insurance simply cannot uh, reach, and like in the most extreme case, like choosing the life into which we are born. But let me try and, and, and bring this down to a more immediate and more current level, which is to talk about health insurance. Uh, and I want to just begin with a couple of, of, of observations about health insurance. The first is everybody who has health insurance is being subsidized by the federal government. Uh, in the case of private market, uh, in case of employer provided health insurance, which is the lion's share of health care insurance in the United States, that comes in the form of a hidden subsidy in the, in the following uh, uh, form, which you can all, I think, very quickly see, which is that from an employer's point of view, buying a health insurance policy for you is another way of delivering compensation to you. They could pay you in cash, they could pay you in pumpkins, they could give you a new car, or they could buy you a health policy. Those are just different ways of giving you compensation income for your services. Employers, therefore, deduct as a business expense, as a cost of doing business, the cost of buying a health care policy for an employee. But by virtue of a quirk in the tax law, dating back to the 1940s, employees don't are not required to include that form and that form only of compensation in income. It's a freebie. Well, by definition, therefore, uh, we, are, we have created a subsidy uh, by which one form of compensation income is not t included in the employee's 1040 at the end of the year, the way all other forms of compensation uh, income are. And that's a $300 billion a year subsidy right, now, right there. So the idea that somehow that, we, that in 2010 we created subsidies for people we don't really relate to very well, uh, and, uh, but you know, we are virtuous is simply false. All of us are being subsidized. Second, and again, this is very hard. The young and healthy, um, I remember, I mean, you know, I have notes from when I was young and healthy. I, I, I look back. Uh, the young and healthy tend to see themselves as young and healthy forever and as sort of invulnerable. Uh, this is just the way we're hardwired. Uh, but it turns out that being required to have health insurance when you're young and healthy is not simply a way of subsidizing those of us in this room who could I be thinking of, who, who are old and feeble, it's also a way of ensuring yourself, your future self. And yes, it's mandatory and it's coerced because it turns out that when you're 20-something, you have piss-poor judgment. You are un incapable of imagining that you, in fact, one day will be as old as I am. Uh, you know, God willing, you will be because the alternative you know, is not terribly interesting. So... <laughs> That is what healthcare, that is why healthcare has to be mandatory. Uh, and that's just, and it works the same way with Social Security. You're 16 years old, you get your first job, you are paying into Social Security from the get go, even though it's impossibly far away as far as you're concerned. Next point about health insurance the most extraordinary single fact I can think is we spend on public spending, government spending at all levels on healthcare, about as much as the other major developed economies around the world on health on healthcare. But then we spend, on top of that, the same amount all over again out of our own pockets. And I would argue that that's a kind of a perverse tax in the sense that to each of us, health is an existential imperative. And so therefore, when we say we, uh, I spend uh, privately on healthcare uh, as much as, uh, uh, is spent for me on health care. I'm not doing that because I think it's a neat kind of consumption item. It's not, in fact, the newest iPhone. I'm doing that because I'm very fond of my existence, and I cling to it in a very non-Buddhist sort of a way. A and as a result, uh, it is a kind of tax I impose on myself. 
So we, in fact, spend in public spending as much as other major countries, and then we t spend, in effect, uh, just as much again in private spending on healthcare. And finally, you have to remember that healthcare is unique in that it is not like other insurance. You buy life insurance, you kick the bucket, your beneficiary gets uh, a, a check. You buy fire insurance on your home, the house burns down, you get a check. Uh, very simple. Health insurance doesn't really work like that. In fact, what you discover in health insurance is that the health insurers are in the managed care business. They just don't say so in those words. They have their networks. They, you could see it in the Los Angeles. On the west side of town, there's this blue blob that, f that, that is seeping over every hospital on the west side of town in the, in the form of the UCLA medical system. On the east side of town, it's, uh, uh, what do we call us? Red, crimson, whatever we are. Uh, and everything is a USC affiliate. And, and right now, the front line is Pasadena, where City of Hope and, and USC are battling it out you know, block by block for control over the doctors, for control over the networks. Uh, because that's how they control their costs, is by creating, uh, in effect, uh, prov by going into the provider business indirectly. So you don't believe me. I got data. So this is, uh, these are my friends at the OECD, uh, uh, showing uh, health insurance spending per capita, uh, basically in, in, in uh, uh, PPP, purchasing power par uh, parity, you don't care. So. Um, Here's the United States. The dark bars are uh, public spending, and the light blue bars, which I hope you can all see, is private spending. So you can see the United States spends in public spending uh, you know, as much as the other major countries, you know, Switzerland, Norway, Netherlands, Germany, Sweden, Luxembourg, uh, even Ireland, uh, Denmark, uh, and, and Canada, and so on. Um, uh, but the United States uniquely spends as much again in private healthcare spending, with the result that we spend nine, uh, about $9,450 per capita per year on healthcare. France, which has a highly regarded public healthcare system, spends uh, about $4,150, less than half as much uh, uh, as we do. So the United States is the biggest outlier in the world when it comes to spending on health care. This has nothing to do with the Affordable Care Act. The data were exactly the same before. Uh, in fact, the Affordable Care Act has bent the curve a little bit uh, uh, favorably. It is a fundamental problem uh, of the idea that there is a place for a, for a market-based health care as the primary delivery mechanism uh, in a country. It's always great to have that as an optional extra for those who can afford it, but no other country of, um, uh, in the OECD relies on the private markets as the principal delivery of healthcare. If we spent what Norway spent per capita, uh, we would save collectively a trillion dollars a year. That's, that's real money, you know, a trillion dollars a year. That's 5% of GDP that we would save. There's just no justification. It's not because um, we don't spend that much more per capita because we're that much richer. We spend about 17% of our GDP, our big GDP, because we are a very rich country on healthcare. Switzerland, France, Germany, they're in the 10, 11, 11.5% 11 range. The Affordable Care Act is not the exp uh, explanatory uh, explanation here. And it, we don't in fact, spend more because we deliver better health care. Of course, we have superb health care outcomes in individual cases where people uh, have successfully navigated the system or can afford the system, but we don't, as a country, have particularly good health care outcomes. And the current bill, um, the repeal and replace bill, has no real answer here. There's, it doesn't have a magic solution. Competition isn't going to change this outcome in ways uh, uh, that people like to believe. We have, for example, interstate, uh, cross-border, cross-state uh, sales of healthcare policies is a big plank in uh, the uh, House Republican plan of coming in phase two, because uh, for technical reasons it can't come in the reconciliation bill. Three states today permit that. Maine, for example, permits that. No company has gone into Maine. Uh, you know, and to offer cross-border 
uh, healthcare because all the doctors and hospitals are locked up already in a network. It's not, in fact, a, a simple case of being a fire insurer where individuals make individual decisions. If fire insurance required the fire insurance companies to have their own fleet of fire trucks, then you would see a very different outcome in the fire insurance market. But that effectively is what is required in the health market. Uh, so you, you, you want data? Here's some more data. So uh, oddly enough, the US is the outlier again. So this is uh, OECD data on unmet care. Uh, people who uh, either don't get the care that they need or don't fill a prescription that is written for them because they can't afford it. And the United States is all the way over there on the right. And what's interesting here is we have, again, two bars. The, so the yellow bar is those with below average incomes. And you see this extraordinarily depressing fact that nearly half of uh, Americans with incomes below average that we're not talking about the poorest Americans, we're talking about the bottom half. Well, that's, you know, 165 million people. Half of lower income Americans have, according to OECD, unmet medical care needs. And even more remarkably, 24%, a, qu a quarter of those with above average incomes have unmet medical needs. You want to talk about outcomes? We could talk about outcomes. Among uh, the OECD 34, life expectancy at, at birth, the United States ranks number 26. Right? Um, you know, this is counting from one is the best, let's be clear. Uh, uh, for women, it's 29. For life expectancy, now, life expectancy at birth to age 65 is uh, um, uh, uh, colored by a couple of extraordinary facts in the United States. One is the number of gun deaths in the United States, which runs about 30,000 gun deaths a year not true in other countries, uh, uh, and, and the other is the problems of substance abuse. Those are problems of young adulthood. Uh, and so it's interesting to ask, well, at age 65, when Social Security kicks in, when Medicare kicks in, what are the results? Well, we're number 22 out of 34 for men and 25 out of 34 for women. Mortality from cardiovascular disease, which is, in fact, um, which used to be a very scary thing, and now is an easily treated thing if you get care um, and can afford uh, your prescription, we're 20 out of 34. Uh, OECD ranks us for the quality of care for asthma, 25th for diabetes, which is in, in, in many ways the most fiscally pernicious of all these diseases because it doesn't kill you overnight. Uh, it, it guarantees an awful, awful life if it's not properly managed. It's fine if it is managed, but if it's not managed, an extraordinarily painful and expensive uh, uh, life. Uh, cervical cancer survival, we're 21st. Breast cancer, uh, we're second. All right, you know, I want to be fair. I, I have some theories as to why that's true, but I, I won't bore this audience with it. Um, uh, doctors per capita were exactly the opposite of what even I would have guessed. We're 27th, uh, in the, uh, and, and for hospital beds, we're 25th. But when it comes to big, expensive equipment, well, of course, we're at or near the top. So um, uh, I, I hope I've begun to depress you, but I want to make sure that, that, I mean, why should I be the only person who can't smile in this audience? Um, but I want to make sure that the young people in particular are, are horrified about their future. So. Uh, let me, let me talk about uh, where we are today in a, from a different perspective. I think this one little chart I cooked up explains everything you need to know about 2016 uh, presidential politics. This blue line shows the, ec the growth of the United States economy in real terms, that is, inflation-adjusted terms. Our economy from 1985 to 2015 grew a lot. It doubled in real inflation-adjusted terms. Uh, in terms of the real median full-time wages, that is the, the, the middle of the pack, full-time male worker, flat since 1985, has not seen a raise in the middle of the pack, male full-time worker has not seen a raise in 30 years. Uh, median household incomes have crept up a little bit, and the reason for that, since going back to 85, is the entry into the workforce of more and more women uh, in um, uh, a household, uh, and a narrowing, uh, but not a closing, 
of the wage gap between male and female wages, which is still a disgrace. Uh, but you'll notice, whichever one you want to look at, that there's a lot of income that isn't getting picked, it isn't being shared with the guy in the middle of the pack. Uh, and that, I think, explains a lot of the social anger that surrounds us today. Uh, we have, as you'll see in a minute, rising top-end inequality. All that growth went somewhere. Somebody captured that growth. Uh, we have a fading belief in equality of opportunity because it's fading. Turns out there's a reason for it. That uh, We have stagnant incomes in, uh, among uh, the middle class, and that inevitably leads to a rage at working harder but falling further behind. There are lots of, of couples where, it's, where the fact that both spouses are in the workforce is a great thing, and there are others where it's an economic necessity and where it's, it's resented. But regardless, it is the norm today, and it was not true 30 years ago, that both spouses uh, are in the workforce, whether they think it's a, a, a fulfilling idea or not. Uh, it uh, creates the misimpression that the game is being rigged against us, um, and it leads us to tribalism, to repudiating any sense of connection to the rest of Americans. But I don't think any of that is inevitable. We have gone in the wrong direction. The rich turn out, you know, really, in fact, to be getting richer. This is a, from 1980 to, to uh, 2013, which was the last year for which data were available. Uh, numbers done by the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. Um, uh, growth in household market incomes. The red line, oddly enough, is the top 1%. The blue line, which has gone up almost not at all, is um, the bottom quintile, the bottom fifth of American households. Uh, and the green line is the middle three quintiles, from the 20th uh, to the 80th. Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 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 yeah, the 20th to the 80th percentiles of household market incomes. The top 1% have captured essentially all of market growth. The top 1% doubled, as you just saw, their share of total national income from uh, about 10-plus uh, percent to 21 percent of all income is captured by the top 1 percent. The top 1 percent of 1 percent, that's the top 1 ten-thousandth of Americans, tripled their share of income. And the top 1 percent of Americans control 42 percent of the nation's wealth and the top one ten thousandth, about 11% of the nation's wealth. And yet, at the same time, you're looking for why we're only number 14 in happiness, we have extraordinarily high levels of poverty uh, today. We have the highest adult poverty rate in the OECD, measured um, in the official OECD way, which is uh, people uh, whose income is half that of the median income. Take the income in the middle of the pack, take half of that, people below that are defined as poverty. We have the highest ratios of rich to poor. Uh, we are the 29th in social spending. So we are unique as being a high income, high inequality country. As this um, chart demonstrates, we're doing only a little bit worse than Turkey, if, if that makes you feel better. Uh, 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 we have, uh, we're this yellow line over here. Uh, the, uh, the red line is the average in the OECD of the percentage of people in the country that are living in the official definition of poverty, which is a relative definition. It looks to the income of each country. Uh, and you know, we're at about, as I recall, 17%. Uh, the average is uh, around 11%. Let me close with a couple of uh, observations here. Uh, what makes a democracy work? Well, our politics in any democracy, especially ours, depend on us working together, which means that we have to understand each other, we have to understand um, our fellow citizens' motives, we have to feel others' pains, and we have to share those values um, that we think define us. We actualize those values through our common action, which is what government is for. That's what government does. It's a way of intermediating uh, among all of us. And I call that institutionalized empathy. And obviously, with a large country with 330 million uh, citizens, all from very different backgrounds, and we can't necessarily all relate to every one of them, uh, the idea that empathy has to be taken to a level of abstraction uh, and made sort of um, uh, more institutionalized 
is the only glue that holds us together. Uh, the glue that holds us together, that applies to all Americans, uh, and that can restore the equality of opportunity, is government fiscal policies. We've just seen the spending side in particular. That's what connects us. We don't have a lot of connection to government in general. Government is not on our backs most of the time. We have once, you know, once every few years, we go to DMV, and we complain about it then for months. You know, we file a tax return once a year. Uh, if we're very unlucky, we have jury duty. That's about it. Uh, uh, it's fiscal policy that year in and year out is the way that we are in fact connected to our fellow Americans. And that's how we actualize our complementary economy. That's how we can seize these economic opportunities. And that I like to think of as our fiscal soul in action. We are citizens of the United States. We are not citizens of California or Texas or Kentucky. Uh, it's the, the idea of defederalization, which is so popular in Washington these days, is a repudiation of what it means to be a citizen, in fact. Uh, citizenship requires that we recognize the opportunities that I've tried to describe uh, uh, and our obligations to each other, uh, and that we then act on those through the intermediation of government, through, in particular, the instrument of fiscal policy. Uh, and if we don't do that, well, then the alternative is we could start thinking, do we choose instead each of us to retreat to his or her own tribe? Uh, or do we uh, uh, choose to beggar the, f the future of our own children? Those are the choices that fiscal policy implies uh, for all of us. Uh, my view, today we are systematically dishonoring uh, the concepts of equal opportunity and economic mobility. Uh, we are a small government, low tax country, and by doing so, we are, we are foregoing all of the opportunities that a real, robust, complementary economy could offer. There are big returns that we're leaving on the table, and we all have to remember that, you know, we all are the beneficiaries of a lot of just plain luck in our lives, and we ought to think about how we share that. So uh, there's more, more that could be said uh, uh, for those who wish, uh, uh, wish to hear or read more uh, in the form of the book. Uh, if you don't read it, not to worry, you're in the majority. Uh, but if you, if you do, obviously, I'd be thrilled. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks so much, Ed. Uh, we're, we're getting a little short on time for questions, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, ask Ed some questions out in the reception that we're going to have right after. We've got some nice uh, LMU gifts for Ed to take with him. Uh, we'll see if he'll wear them on the USC campus or not, or just off in his neighborhood. But uh, let's give him a big round of applause. Uh, while he may not have uh, raised our immediate happiness quotient tonight, I think he did get us to think about a lot of serious things and about the mission here we have at LMU. So please uh, meet, meet Ed outside. Thanks, Ed. <laughs>